Hi, I'm Thomas, the Accidental DM, and today I got some exciting news I was, wasn't really expecting because uh, in my email I received a notification that the new uh, Dune uh, Adventures in the Imperium RPG uh, Modifius had just released in the Quickstarter for this, um, as well as with the Quickstarter, as kind of typical with those, there's also an included adventure. Uh, and so I just wanted to take the opportunity then just to kind of drop everything, jump right on and take a look at it. Um, just a bit of a warning, there may be spoilers involved because uh, I really do kind of want to take a look through the whole thing. Uh, but without further ado, uh, let's get started. But be warned, there may be spoilers. All right, uh, and so we can see just kind of with the very kind of beginning of all of this, uh, very similar in terms of just the uh, using the cover art from the uh, uh, from the player's guide or from the, uh, the core rulebook to kind of take a look at it. So let's just kind of go through here and see what we've got. Uh, the credits, uh, of course, that are there. Uh, introduction. Okay, so let's zoom in just a little bit so we can get a little bit of an easier look at things. All right, uh, welcome to the last years of the Imperium, because remember, Dune Adventures of the Imperium is set right before then the period of Dune, uh, the first book by Frank Herbert, so before the uh, kind of the takeover of uh, Paul Atreides, Paul Muad'Dib, uh, as the new kind of the emperor. Uh, so welcome to the last years of the Imperium, an era tens of thousands of years in the future. Uh, in this time, the known universe is ruled by the emperor and the great houses, a feudal place where noble families rule, hold planets in the service of the emperor, but politic ruthlessly in the shadows for power and control. Uh, so kind of giving us then a lot of that flavoring of what this is about. So remember, this is kind of a quick starter, uh, so people then wouldn't necessarily have all that much knowledge about it, so they want to kind of give, I guess, a little bit of a kind of an introduction to what we see here. Uh, so it talks about the thinking uh, machines, the Butlerian uh, Jihad, the bi building up the great schools, the Mentas, the Bene Gesserits, uh, the Spacing Guild, etc. Uh, what you need to play, of course, uh, 20 sided dice. I remember uh, 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 Dune Adventures of the Imperium kind of really makes major changes then to the 2D20 system, so there aren't any challenge dice, so it really is all about the 2D20s. Um, some tokens for keeping. Uh, track of momentum and determination, uh, paper and pencils, and then there are some pre-generated characters, so we'll take a look at those as we go through there as well. All right, uh, okay, so it's just kind of a lot more of the um, uh, flavor. The Dune Adventures that I signed to introduce you to this groundbreaking sci-fi universe, setting the stage for the climatic events that follow the arrival of House of Atreides on Dune. We provide a set of pre-generated player characters. Uh, if you have the D Dune core rulebook, you may also use your own characters uh, and House to play this adventure. In this case, they may be arriving to begin a new venture in Spice Mighty under license from House Harkonnen. While the Harkonnens are supposedly allies, no House is foolish enough to trust even their allies. Okay. Uh, basic rules, so uh, just kind of give us kind of the ba uh, the idea of how to play the game. Uh, so the basic tests, uh, where you then kind of having then a, a skill um, as well as an attribute to kind of go together with a difficulty to determine how well that's going to be. Uh, so yeah, we have the talking about the target number, successes, uh, etc. Skills, each character has a rating for each skill, five skills, each rated from four to five. Uh, so those are kind of listed there. So if you're familiar then with the core rulebook, um, I kind of looked through that, then you would be aware of this as well. Or if you saw um, my uh, uh, kind of uh, overview that I'm working on on the Octum Cthulhu, which is also by Modifius as well. Uh, so battle, uh, communicate, uh, what else do we have here? Uh, discipline, move, understand, and then the, the focus is focus on creature characters, chance of scoring a critical success. Uh, the drives, uh, so that's kind of uh, um, uh, the talents that one might have to kind of get you moving, drives are added to your character skill to drive the target number. Excuse me, those are, <laughs> I'm getting those mixed up, but that's the attributes, uh, what we would think of uh, in terms of some of the other games. Uh, some of the terminology has changed a little bit as well, and so we see what those are. Uh, but these are the things that really kind of are at the core of who the individual PC is. Uh, so we see duty, faith, justice, power, truth, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, traits, uh, complications, and assets. So kind of a brief little talk about what those are. Uh, setting the difficulty for the game master to know how to do those. Difficulty zero test, what to do with those. Okay, skill test procedure. So the basic core mechanics then of how this works. Uh, we're seeing that the game master usually selects one skill to be used when the player should pick one drive. So it's... Um, really kind of then a work between the player and the GM to determine how skill tests are going to go forward. Uh, so the game master is choosing the skill, whereas the player is the one that's choosing uh, the drive because that, um, I think it talked about, let's see if it talks about how that mechanic works. Drives are added to your character's skill to drive the target number when they attempt to test, but they also define why your character is acting. Um, okay, so they're not telling us exactly yet. Um, use duty when it's your character's responsibility. 
um, just as drive towards balance of, and fairness. Players often try to pick their highest drives uh, as often as possible. It's perfectly fine as their character naturally tries to play their strengths, but the game master may decide this makes them predictable. Okay, so it's not telling us the mechanical piece yet. Maybe it's going to be a little bit farther down. Might be jumping ahead just a little bit. Game master sets the difficulty. Um, uh, but traits, threat, and other factors can increase or decrease difficulty. The players and game masters should also finalize any traits that apply. Uh, you make two D20s plus any D20s that you buy. Uh, each D20 that rolls the target is a single success. Each die that rolls one critical success. Ah, okay, if the focus applies, then each die that rolls equal to the skill. Okay, each die that rolls a 20 is a complication. The number of successes scored equals or exceeds the difficulty. Okay, uh, then the game master describes the outcome of the skill test. All right, so it's not giving us yet anyway the kind of the importance then of these drives uh improving the odds so spending momentums uh adding to threat those sorts of things some of the common uses of momentum uh, buying d20s of course uh, creating a trait creating an asset obtaining information uh then the threats that's what the uh the gm's version then of uh, momentum is a little bit oversimplified but that's really what it is uh complications and escalations uh npc momentum all right the spending of threat um very similar to what we kind of saw in the core rule book and kind of describing what those are, buying D20s, increasing difficulty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, contests and extended tests, gaining information. Oh, here's one, I, rival house action. I don't remember reading about that before. The game master may spend one threat point to introduce a known enemy house to the situation. It may be one of their agents simply taking an opportunity to attack the player characters or may turn out they have an alliance with whomever the player characters are dealing with. Okay, uh, so again, it's just spending threat in order to bring in more enemies, uh, but it's kind of focusing it then, looks like, on the uh, kind of the rival house's action. I'll have to go back and look at the core rulebook, because this might be um, something that's being added. not sure uh, that. Uh, gaining information, um, okay, a conflict, the nature of conflict. Uh, conflicts cover a multitude of different forms of contest, from physical fights to intrigue and assassination, because remember, it's, Dune's a very politically heavy game, uh, kind of religious, morals, uh, Actions, politics, all that sort of stuff. So it's all kind of in there. Uh, then we're giving the, the forms of the different types of conflicts uh, that we can see. Um, so we've got then uh, dueling here, skirmishes, warfare, espionage, entry, because um, there's that kind of the micro and then the, the macro as well, kind of way of handling and dealing with these things. Uh, basics of conflict, who goes first? Um, Generally, actions alternate between the player character side and the conflict. When a character side is a turn, any single character on that side who has not acted. All right, uh, so this is a lot then of what we saw in the uh, uh, the core rulebook. I'm wondering if some of this is uh, just kind of moved over uh, and simplified a bit for, from the core rulebook. Uh, conflict overview, choose an asset to use. Based on the type of attack you're making, choose an appropriate skill and drive, as well as a focus if one applies. Roll your contests. On a successful attack, the outcome depends on your target. If your foe is a minor character, uh, they are defeated. Because remember, as I said earlier, uh, no D6s anymore, no challenge dies. Otherwise, defeating the foe is an extended task uh, with a requirement equal to the foe's uh, most appropriate skill. Uh, resisting defeat. Uh, okay. Uh, once per scene, if your character would be defeating, you may choose to resist defeat. Defeating, resisting defeat prevents that defeat from occurring. Your character remains active in the scene. All right. Uh, when you choose to resist defeat, uh, defeat, it costs one point of momentum or adds one to threat and causes you to suffer a complication. Non-player characters uh, opposing players spend threat instead. This complication could cause a loss of one of your assets and the advantage the enemy gains over you or hindrance. And then we have a talk about assets, the difference between the, the tangible and the intangible ones, uh, tangible ones being really physical things. Um, uh, for instance, the um, uh, what's the the belt, the, the kind of the guardian belt. Um, I can't remember the name off the top of my head at the moment. I think it's kind of a tangible asset, and the intangible assets would be kind of information. You know, if you're the political intrigue type of stuff or cultivating friendship type of thing uh, is being in there. Uh, zones, uh, kind of a part of the conflict. Uh, moving an asset. When you take your turn, you may take a single action to either move an asset or use an asset. Uh, you may attempt to move in a subtle way trying to avoid attention, or you may move in a bold manner that draws attention. Uh, in either case, this requires a skill test with a difficulty of two, right? using assets, uh, types of assets, so defensive, targeting, uh, creating a trait or asset. You can create traits or asset representing finding weapons on a battlefield or other methods of gaining a strategic advantage costing two momentum. All right, uh, so we've got 80 and an ally. Okay, ah, and worm sign. Now this is the, this is the, um, 
uh, included scenario that goes then with the game. Uh, so if you don't want anything spoiled, and you know, I normally don't show these, but I'm kind of excited about this. I really want to see what's in here myself, and uh, maybe it's a time to kind of show some of that with, uh, with you guys as well. But forewarned, we're going to be taking a look then at here. So if you're a player or want to, want to be player, do not continue. Uh, so let's kind of jump in and see what we have here. Worm sign. Uh, and I beheld another beast coming out of the sand. He had two horns like a lamb, but his mouth was fanged and fiery as the dragon, and his body shimmered and burned with great heat while it did hiss like the serp serpent. Revised Orange Catholic Bible. The following should only be read by gay masters. All right, like I said, warning. Uh, who should take time to fully read through the adventure before running this game? The gay master should be as familiar with the rules as possible. Okay, uh, though the players are welcome, even encouraged to read the rules and system beforehand as well. Not the adventure, just the rules. Uh, okay, so, okay, normal stuff. Game begins, uh, players one point of determination. Game master begins with two points of threat for each player. Um, then our momentum pool then begins at zero for the players. Okay, then we jump right in and let's see what we have here. This, uh, cool, it, uh, something called worm sign, and we're seeing this image in the background. Uh, massive, massive giant worm coming at them. Uh, as we have then a couple of people trying to uh, uh, rush over to one of the ornithopters in order to get uh, get out of there in time. Uh, lots. Hopefully, it's going to be some excitement in here to kind of live up to that. Adventure begins with the player characters, a small omnithopter flying over the vast shield wall that protects the city of Iraq and from the desert of Arrakis, also known as Dune. The omnithopter is quite cramped, uh, having only just enough room for all the group, but the journey should not take very long. Each character is wearing a still suit so they can survive in the desert. All right, so you're getting things where you're supposed to be. Uh, let's take just a little bit of a look at some of the uh, opening dialogue that we get here. The sun glares off the ornithopter windshield as you crest over the immense stone wall that surrounds the city of Arakim. Before you, before you stretches an ocean of sand, a vast desert that covers the entire planet of Arrakis, or Dune to the Fremen who live there. While the cockpit is air-conditioned, you can see the shimmers of heat uh, haze rising from the waves of dunes ahead of you, stretching beyond the horizon. Okay, we're, we're, we're getting imagery, and that's good. That's always a good scene, If because uh, the Dune game, as I was kind of reading about it and learning, reading through the core rulebook, uh, it's all about cinem uh, the cinematic element of it, and we're getting, I think, a lot of that here, a lot of the sights and getting us an idea of the, the way things feel. Um, Knows, I can get some descriptors of, descriptors of some smells in there soon. Uh, you have set off the day to investigate reports that a group of spice smugglers might be operating in an area your house has a contract to harvest spice. It is your job to find their base. However, spice smugglers can often have useful contacts, and occasionally the loss of a little spice can be worth a new ally. Okay, um, all right. And so then we're given our very first role then. Uh, let's see. A uh, group has been given location of the suspected settler base, but it's camouflage and hard to spot. Uh, players should decide which of them is piloting. Okay, so first is going to be a pilot move, I guess. Uh, make a difficulty zero move, uh, zero move to test to see how well you're piloting the craft. So that's going to be the very kind of first one as you're kind of moving out there and going on. I wonder if there's going to be some... Uh, Issues. If no one can spot from the air, they will need to take a second pass over the area where they can make the same test again with the best uh, result spotting the base. However, the, okay. However, the second pass will be seen by the smugglers. Okay, because there, there there needs to be something that happens. Um, I don't know though. I might change that up just a little bit myself. Uh, well, I mean, it's a difficulty of zero. Oh no, the spot the base. I'm sorry, I, mean, I didn't see that up there. The the moving of uh, the flying is a difficulty of zero. To spot the base though is a difficulty of two discipline tests. Okay, so there there is possibility then of failure with that. Um, okay, it's interesting they put that there. But um, if you fail the the the, the second time, then uh, you will be spotted. Um, I don't know. I might. Um, I always think, though, in terms of gameplay, there needs to be some reason for them to be able to roll again, or else they're just going to keep chucking, 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 chucking dice, and, you know, <laughs> that's not what this is about. Um, so maybe something else kind of, uh, there's a glint or something, um, maybe if someone, um, succeed at cost, or the succeed at cost thing could be, I think, that's probably the better way to do it, succeed at cost then in order to go over. Uh, let's see what else we have in here. Um, okay, then uh, scene two. Okay, so there's, uh, we're getting just little pieces of it, so it's not kind of uh, fully fleshing every little bit out. That's nice. So then scene two is going to be about the base. Uh, give a little bit of description there of uh, where it's situated. Okay, um, approaching the base. Okay, 
Uh, what do we have? The player characters while landing the Omnicopter is dangerous. Uh, the Freeman, a few smugglers know to walk without rhythm to avoid tracking sandstorms. Okay. Uh, the base approach more stealthily will have to make a difficulty three understanding uh, test. Okay. Uh, so we're getting them kind of the approaching. Uh, then an issue with the rival house. Unfortunately, the characters don't have as long as I think to talk to the smugglers or Harkonnens or rival house of player characters. Yes, I know I might not be pronouncing Harkonnen correctly. I remember from the David Lynch movies. Uh, I know in the audiobooks there's a different way of pronouncing it, um, and I just can't remember that is top of my head. And Harkonnen, uh, the Harkonnens kind of uh, flows. Or maybe I'm getting those backwards. Yeah. Anyway, the, what comes out is what comes out. Um, I've been reading, uh, listening to a lot of the audiobooks lately as well. Uh, so we're going to have to deal then with some rival houses, it looks like. Uh, player characters often just dealing with the soldiers depend on how the adventure is being played. The player characters are Atreides and House Atreides has just taken control. The Harkonnens are not only out of their jurisdiction, but acting illegally. So that is a different thing. Uh, the player characters are not Atreides. The soldiers should be from a rival house instead of the Harkonnens. In this case, the rival house has no right to be here. Uh, it is an area under contract to the player's character's house. Okay, so again, it's something that it shouldn't be there. So how is that going to happen? Uh, they may want to just attack the rival house. Okay. Uh, okay, and then we have then uh, just some... Uh, uh, stats then for a couple of uh, soldiers for the Arconans or Rival House, uh, minor supporting characters. Twelve soldiers, wow, okay. Um, battle of six, uh, they have short blades and Maula rifles. Uh, then we also have some spice smugglers who are also minor supporting characters. Uh, not quite as hardy as those Harkonnen uh, soldiers, though, so battle four, uh, on, uh, communication five, but they have stealth and they have smuggling, which makes perfect sense because they're smugglers. Uh, then, it looks like in the midst of everything, there will be the worm sign, all right, the titular event then of what's going to happen. Unfortunately, all this activity has indeed called a great sand, uh, sandworm to the area. Uh, yeah, because uh, sandworms are attacked to vibrations, and so this is what they're getting for uh, being more interested in fighting amongst themselves. It's probably the direction it went. Oh, no, so there might have been some talking along there as well. Don't want to say how you have to run your game, but uh, my guess is, particularly if it's the Archons, they're gonna there's going to be some fighting going on. Um, so the worm approaches. The player carries a few options of which direction to run, only one of which is a good idea. Um, okay. Um, that's... All right, let's, let's just go on. The player characters try to walk without rhythm. As they escape, they can do so as above, but unless they are the only people going in that direction, it won't make any difference except slowing them down. The worm is almost there and will swallow everything in the path, whether it senses it or not. Um, now, in the world of, of the Dune universe, yes, uh, once kind of a worm sign has gotten there, um, or worm's coming, there's not a whole lot you can do, but just get out of there. Uh, Maybe there's some other ideas. I'm not off the top of my head thinking of some other ways because I, I don't like, I just don't like in the text where it just says uh, the only way they can do it because I think there could be some other ways of maybe getting around that. But yeah, once the, the worm sign has arrived, there, that's there. If there are soldiers, Omnithopters, the smuggler's base is the obvious way to escape, of course. If someone, the player characters, Omnithopter is still in one piece, they could make a run for that. Uh, the smuggler's base is in a small cave. Okay, because that is an important thing. The um, the worms are not, the great worms of Arrakis are not able to kind of penetrate then the, the kind of the solid rock, uh, only going through the sand uh, itself. So that's always an idea. Large enough set of rocks on a short run away, they can offer that. Okay, so trying to get out of that, uh, what rises from the desert? Ah, once safe, the player characters see the worm rise from the desert, a sight as terrifying as it is majestic. They can do little but watch as it destroys everything in its path. It shatters the smuggler's fragile rock outcropping and consumes everything in the area, leaving only rubble and ruin. The player characters may try to see if the worm destroyed the spice stores, but it will take a lot of digging to find out. Uh, and there might be another worm. Uh, then scene four, the desert people. Looks like then we get an introduction then to the, uh, the Fremen. The rocks may be safe from the worms, but they are not without their own hazards. A small group of Fremen have taken shelter here and do not appreciate visitors. They are uh, kind of a very secretive group um, and don't like them coming into their, into their homes. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, I believe they're called CTs. Uh, don't quote me on that one, but that's just what's off the top of my head. Uh, and so kind of interacting with them. So I think it's good getting this opportunity then um, almost immediately to kind of interact then with the local population because the Fremen uh, are a major part of Arrakis. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, a lot happens. I don't, you know, if you haven't read the books, haven't seen the movies, I don't want to give any of that stuff away. But I mean, they're, they're a major player in uh, what will ultimately happen. Uh, uh, in the known universe, in the Imperium, and not just on Arrakis, Arrakis itself, on Dune itself. 
Um, okay, uh, the role fails. If we tell the player character, the president is not welcome in the desert. Yeah, um, see that a lot in the books, uh, that there's testing going on. Uh, and then there's an epilogue. On the assumption the player characters uh, make it out of the desert alive, then you explain to their house what happened. However, they may have learned some useful secrets uh, and begun to make some allies. Okay, uh, we'll take a look at those uh, player characters, NPCs in just a second. I'm surprised we don't get um, a... Um, write up a uh, stat block for the Fremen, but uh, at least for one of them or their leader maybe to kind of have a conversation with, but okay. Um, it's nice, we get at the very, very beginning, we did get this lovely, lovely kind of imagery of the sun glares off the Omnithopter windshield as you crest over the mints, but we don't get that elsewhere um, in here. So uh, that might be a kind of a little bit of a missed opportunity on this one. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay. Anyway, art, again, art is lovely, but let's look down at the pre-generated characters at this point. So we have a Mentat, of course, uh, they're kind of the, the human computers. Um, so you have uh, a new one, uh, Sharafel. You have just left the Mentat school uh, and you are eager to experience life in service to a noble house. You may be a little naive at time, but your detachment also helps you see every situation with a clarity and clouded with social mores and preconceptions. You find serving alongside a mentat like Thurfir Hawat quite intimidating. You're glad to be assigned somewhere. You may prove yourself out from under his shadow. Uh, and then we see then uh, her particular talents, cool under pressure. Uh, attempt a task uh, using the understanding skill before rolling. You may spend a determination point to automatically succeed at that task, but you generate no momentum. Uh, intense study. Once per senior, you use your understand skill on a single test instead of any other skill, and your account is having to focus. Uh, and then the Mentat discipline, uh, you have almost perfect recall for even the most complex data. Um, starts off with a knife, contacts with the Spice Mining community, and has a personal shield. That's what it was. I couldn't remember. Oh, it's such a simple, simple thing. I couldn't believe I didn't remember what it was. I uh, will be careful with those personal shields. They can get you into some trouble, just saying, if someone's got a laser. Um, then we have the drives and the skills there. Okay, and nice, we've got this kind of full uh, full page image to kind of get a, a full idea, a full picture of the character. Nice. Uh, Talia Carell, a criminal. Okay, you were rescued from a life on the streets by House of Trades. Had a, Duncan Idaho knows something about that too. They gave you a home and had a use for your skills and contacts in return. You gave them your loyalty while you have learned um, how to act in a more well-to-do company. Your instincts have not left you and you're quick to turn to violence when you feel threatened. Uh, so a dangerous scum is a trade criminal to run the underworld on Arrakis. That's ambition. Okay, that's their ambition. Uh, talents, decisive action. Uh, you succeed at battle test to remove an opponent's assets, and you bought one or more dice. You may spend two points of momentum to remove a second enemy asset. Okay, so you can take two out. Uh, driven, after you spend a point of determination, roll 1d20 for roll, equal to or under the discipline rating, uh, you immediately regain, re regain the point of determination. Okay, so, okay, nice. Uh, slow blade, when you make an attack during a duel or a skirmish, using a melee weapon, you may buy one or more dice by spending momentum. You may choose one of the enemy's assets in the same zone as you attack. You can ignore the asset during your attack. Okay, slow blade. Um, for those that aren't aware, uh, the slow blade is one of the only things that really can uh, get through the uh, the personal shield. Uh, um, so uh, bullets and things like that are not able to penetrate it, but something going very, very slow is able to get through. Uh, sorry, assets, a knife with a poison reservoir. Of course, uh, they're a criminal. Contact on Arrakis who leads a gang and a friend within the Arakeen underworld. Okay, very good. Uh, okay, I wonder if we're going to get another full-size picture. Yes, okay. So that's the theme. I think we're going to get a full-size picture with all of our pre -gen. So we've got two so far. So we've got a Mentat, we've got a criminal. Uh, then we have a servant, Hassan Diago. Um, you train and work hard to become a servant, working for a noble house as an honor you strive hard to live up to. As a servant, you are often overlooked, granting the opportunity to observe and overhear many things that House of Trades would find useful. It also grant you a far better understanding of how to behave among the upper classes than most noble born. Okay, uh, talents as an advisor, cautious and subtle words, uh, ambition to become a renowned spy for my house. Ah, interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, ambitions are kind of the uh, the underlying motivations, the kind of overarching goal that they're ultimately trying to go for, if you're not too familiar with that. So Hassan Diago, uh, there's a nice full-size image of, uh, of him. Uh, ah, Bene Gesserit Navas, very good. Uh, you spent most of your life training among the sisters of the Bene Gesserit. Uh, well, their more advanced skills still lead you. You control of your body and ability to observe what is going on around you. A minute detail are incredible. While you continue your training, you now serve House Atreides as one of their agents. Uh, but do so as a simple handmaid of the Lady Jessica. You report back to the sisterhood, but no one knows your background except you to do otherwise. Uh, 
uh, she wants to become a reverend mother. So that's kind of the kind of the one of the higher tiers in the Bene Gesserit order, having the ability then to kind of commune with the uh, the ancestors uh, in the Bene Gesserits um, and uh, have a lot more. Uh, powers. Uh, the Bene Gesserits are often called witches in the uh, in the known universe and uh, it's kind of from that that part of that bolds from. Uh, talents, uh, hyper awareness, uh, passive scrutiny, and prana bindu, a Bene Gesserit talus, a talent. Well, I don't remember what that is. I might have to go back and read The Sisterhood of Dune. Uh, that might be in there. Starting uh, assets, a Duke of Dune tarot cards. Contact among the Bing Jesuits, of course you'd have a contact there, and then a small knife that can be easily hidden. Very good, all right, and nice full uh, image then of, uh, of her as well. What was her name again? Anna, Anna Margrave, Anna Margrave. Okay, um, many Jesuits are often from the nobility, um, but I don't really think there has, I don't think it's specifically to them alone. Then we have a sword master's apprentice, Marcus Sin. Uh, you joined House of Trades as a soldier, hoping to find excitement and adventure. Both your skill with a blade singled you out for attention from Duncan Idaho himself. Uh, he took on, took you on as an apprentice, and you learned uh, more f than you ever thought possible from him. First opportunity to test your skills out in the field. Okay, and his ambition is to become a sword master of the house. He's bold, has deliberate motion, uh, and he makes haste. Uh, he has a personal shield, a friend among the mercenaries, and a sword with the House of Trades crest. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, uh, okay. Now, Corbin Brolic, a reformed spice smuggler. Okay, you are the only member of the group who have, whose loyalty to House Atreides has not been tested quite yet. You were brought out, up on Arrakis as part of a spice smuggling family and was a good life until the Harkonnens tracked you down and everything got bad very fast. It typically does around them. You have used up every favor to get off the planet and find sanctuary of the Atreides. Unfortunately, it looks like now you are going home again. You really hope that none of the Harkonnens got a look at you before you ran. Uh, so his ambition is to stay alive long enough to get rich. He's bold as well. Uh, collabor collaboration in battle uses subtle words. Okay. Uh, so is that the last of them? Yes. Again, nice art. Okay, so we have the, how many pregens do we have with this? Let me go back through and take a look. I was meaning to count them as we were going through. So we've got uh, Shara, one, uh, two, uh, three, four, five and six so we've got six overall and then we have just kind of the advertisement there at the end okay so that is then a, a little bit of a look then at uh, dune adventures of the imperium warren sign uh the dune quick start uh interesting I, I think i think it gives then as a quick start i think it really does give us then all the kind of the information we need um in terms of what i saw in the uh the adventure itself okay it to me it seems a little bit similar to one that's actually in the core rule book um and i think now, we're just kind of skimming through it here, and I have read through completely the one in the core rulebook, um, but it seems to be a lot of similarities uh, between the two. Um, but, you know, this is uh, the worm sign. It's a, a free PDF to kind of, that's uh, quick start. Uh, so uh, probably be getting people into the system, learning about it, kind of going into that and finding some things about it. I would be interested, because I think my, my, my one critique, at least about the... Um, uh, included adventure in the core rulebook is it doesn't seem to give them that kind of grand scope that uh, Dune um, kind of is meant to be about, uh, you know, a, a world that spans the entire known universe. Uh, and I see a little bit of that then as well in this particular one. It's, it's a, it looks like it's going to be a little bit more about fighting. I think there is then that ability uh, specifically when kind of meeting up with the Fremen, uh, having then the opportunity to kind of engage more in kind of the diplomatic pieces of it maybe. Um, but I can see then wanting to kind of jump in and have a little bit of a, of a kind of a set battle piece to kind of get people uh, interested in the game because uh, depending upon types and interests, I think uh, a lot of people do like a lot more fighting with it. Um, I would have just liked to have seen it kind of be that bigger uh, cinematic version that I was hoping for, but hey, who knows? Uh, people play it how they're going to play it, and they can look at, the, look at the exact same thing that I see, and it comes up in a very, very different way, and how it plays out at the table, as well as when you're playing it around with, the, with your player groups, uh, what they're going to think about it. But anyway, that's Dune Adventures, the Imperium Worm Sign, uh, the new Dune uh, quick start for it. Um, I really am looking forward to kind of getting my hands on, on a full copy of it. I like having the, uh, the book in hand to kind of really go through it, but it's a system I'm the more I read about it, the more I look at it, and this is still, it gets me excited about Dune. Uh, this quick starter does, uh, and I can see some, this is being kind of a minor piece of maybe a larger um, 
a set, uh, kind of a set campaign that I might be interested in kind of working on, just kind of popping these little pieces in because then you have that opportunity to kind of meet the Fremen and have that first contact. Uh, we start to see then the intrigue of what the Harkonnens are doing even after the Atreides have arisen, uh, come to the come to Arrakis itself uh, with their legal claim given to them by the <clears throat> Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV. So, but anyway, lots here, lots of excitement. Uh, thanks for watching and I hope to see you again.